which is does its part to make uh, places in San Benito County better, I think. Some people think otherwise. And um, I've been a forager since I was at least two years old when I learned to collect mussels and clams as a kid out on Long Island. And from there moved on to berries, blackberries and wild raspberries and blueberries. And I uh, had a big jump up in elementary school when I lived outside of Madison, Wisconsin, where I learned to catch all sorts of fish and crayfish and find, other, uh, find wild asparagus that got away from the fields and other kinds of things. And then between ninth and 10th grade, I went on a trip uh, with uh, National Outdoor Leadership School, Knowles, Delander, Wyoming. And that was kind of the big breakthrough. One, I got really tired of the food they gave us. And I learned about all the edible plants. I started collecting mushrooms. I made about 30 or 40 different preparations of the trout I caught there. I began to make things like curried trout and all sorts of things. And at that point, it kind of took off from there. I've always bought almost every book that I can imagine of foraging. At the university, I picked up an interest in mushrooms with David Aurora over there and the Fungus Federation. I sold mushrooms for a while to restaurants. Uh, and then, um, you know, I studied marine biology and I know almost all the species of things, you know, starting with my interest in eating them and moving on to other, to actually leaving a few of them alone. And uh, so pretty much wherever I walk, I, uh, I kind of see things in a lot of different layers. I see, you know, just the beauty of the place, and then I start seeing species and interactions, and then I start seeing what I could bring home for dinner. And right here is just a beautiful start. This stand here could feed loads of people. Mostly what you're seeing out here is this beautiful flower, which is the, uh, what people call wild radish, which is actually not really so, because it's a hybrid of the Eurasian radish that people grew in gardens with a native California plant called jointed Sherlock, which almost you can't find anymore because it turns out that their offspring, like so many um, offspring of mixed parentage, turned out to be uh, more successful than their parents. And this hybrid is everywhere and it is a spectacular food. The flowers are delicious and beautiful and salads. The, uh, the little sprouts or little broccolettes are really nice stir-fried. All the leaves can be stir-fried. It makes a wonderful blended soup where if you just boil it or stir-fry it and then put it with you know a high-powered blender with some kind of broth, whether it's a vegetarian broth like soy-based miso or a chicken broth or even a fish broth, you make a wonderful green soup and you thicken it usually with a potato or something similar. And so the nicest part of it, I like, this time of year is when it's setting up these new stalks. And see how floppy this stalk is? When you have a piece that just snaps like that, this is all really tender and sweet. Take a, take a piece, you know, we're a little too close. Take that piece right there. We're supposed to keep our social distance. Right. So if you snap off that piece and try the stem of that one, just to eat a little bit of that. Mm. Mm, so radishy. It's not mm -hmm. yet sweet, a little sweet. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. got a little bit of that horseradish um, mm -hmm. wasabi bite. Right. You could easily make a wasabi substitute out of it. Yeah. So we look at, at how much there is here. And of course, nobody cares if you collect the hybrid radish jointed Sherlock. It's considered invasive weed. Anywhere where you're on moist, moist areas, on the sides of roads, you want to, of course, avoid places where there's pollution, but it is all over the place. Teacher, and what, how about this one here? So, thank you, uh, thank you, son. No, thank you, <laughs> Michael. This, 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 is one, one, uh, this is one of the docks over here. This one that is related to spinach and Swiss chard. And when it's like this, we're still too close. Um, everybody back off a little bit. We want to not share germs, just knowledge. Um, it is sour and it's not fantastic raw that you can sometimes take the very small leaves and mix it into a salad in small amounts. 
but as a cooked vegetable, chopped up, you can make and blended, you can make a sour kind of sauce. It's related to rhubarb, and you can use that sour no sauce in, in Asian, no yeah, Asian recipes, or you can actually make desserts with it. If you take it and mix it with, say, apple, you can make the equivalent of an apple rhubarb pie with that sour flavor to contrast some of the supermarket apples, which are too sweet. What's it called, Andy? It's called, it's called dock, and I don't know what's, I've never really learned the different docks very well. There's several. Okay, let's, oh, here are the boundary between, say, uh, kind of suburbia and the wild areas. You often get um, plants that are moving down from there, like the uh, pepper tree. That, that's, that, no one planted that pepper tree there. One of the seeds, you know, grew there, and that's from Chile that tree and the, the um, it's actually in the mango family, the little red berries. And if you just take them when they're ripe and just chew them, you get this peppery and sweet flavor, makes a spectacular tea. You can take it and do a alcohol extract and make a beautiful pink liqueur with it. And it has just a really unique flavor, kind of a little bit like Szechuan pepper. Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about where we are right now? So we are on the edge of, this is, I believe, Watsonville Slough. And it's one of the five sloughs that are like fingers in the middle of Watsonville. One of the most spectacular wetlands in America, I think. It's like a little um, Everglades. And I, I taught right by here at Tumble Valley High School, and I was the only person to ever take a class of students out kayaking. On the wetlands, we have Monterey Bay kayaks came out, and 65 kids got the kayak in the wetlands. It, out here, it's full of fish, mostly non-native fish, however, but you see uh, osprey, you see ibises, uh, you see uh, oh, lots and lots of waterfowl, there's places where there are flooded forests where crayfish are walking up and down. This, you know, there are carp that are 12, 15 pounds that bang into your boat. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that bothers me about it, as rich as this is, and there could potentially be a very rich fishery here, especially of the non-natives, which most people believe you should remove, is that um, for years I've asked authorities around here if they ever tested the fish to see if they're safe or not. Because up at Pinto Lake, they found that the carp up there had uh, very, very unsafe levels of DDT. And I know that at the Buena Vista labor camp by the dump over here, people recreationally fish, especially for the large cap, carp and the catfish. And so I reached out to the Santa Cruz Department of Environmental Health just two weeks ago. And a, a very wonderful woman talked to me about it. And she tried to get some data. And she was told by our higher-ups that nobody really cares to test the fish because, frankly, who cares if some Mexicans get contaminated, you know, and their kids. But the worry right now with a shelter in place is maybe even the past they were maybe catching one fish every couple months. But now that a lot of people have a lot more time on their hands, maybe people are catching a big carp every week. Mm -hmm. And feeding one of these guys that's grubbing in the bottom. This used to be farmland along this. Yeah. About the hemlock? Yes. So, so this stunning plant right over here. Thank you. So this stunning plant right over here um, is hemlock. And this, this one has, let's see if I can get it. Come on, yeah. A little bit of Socrates. Yes, they call this, these red dots, they call it the blood of Socrates. This is the plant, and it's very common in these same places. I once had a piece served to me in a salad at a restaurant, and I called in the uh, chef, and because the waiter didn't believe me that there was a poisonous plant in my salad. Very dangerous and poisonous. And it was the plant that Socrates, the philosopher of Athens, was forced to drink the tea made out of it when he was uh, convicted for, of corrupting the youth. And frankly, if a, if, a, if a teacher is not corrupting the youth, they're probably not a teacher. <laughs> no, no, you know what it looks like too, Professor, that it looks like dill and anise yes, and all those. Thank you, sir. So it, it looks like so many plants that we eat. It looks like carrot tops. It looks like parsley. It looks like cilantro. It looks like celery. 
deal. But this group, the umbellifera, the parsley relatives, contain actually a number of very poisonous plants, but also some of the most tasty herbs known to humanity and great vegetables. And so it's a plant to be well aware of. It has a really unpleasant smell as compared to parsley or cilantro or fennel, which we're gonna run into pretty soon, which is a close relative. Fennel smells like licorice and is wonderful. This smells like something that you wouldn't want to eat, but if it was mixed in or somebody made a blended soup, not knowing better, you would not be in good shape. Good <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, this, this plant. This one's a fat sandy. Yeah. Oh, but here's the fennel that we were just mentioning. So let me wipe my hand of the. Uh, so here's our fennel. It was, uh, I believe, it was originally brought by the Italians who farmed around this area. It is now one of our most widespread weeds and one of our most useful plants. It is. Uh, get a piece of the stem there, Michael. So. This, that part is really good. You peel it like this. Andy showed me this the other day. It's good for a lot of things. You go for the inside. It's not not quite ready. If we got it a little thicker, we need have this nice peel, tender. Uh, and this thing. outer scuff peels off, kind of like the banana thing. And then oh, this. We'll, let the, we'll find a thicker but, one. But anyway. Yeah, so it's it's good. Like salary, but like you know, it's got yeah, the texture. Of sand you want. We ate this end. This is the and this time of year, it's really good. So this we'll one, big one, this fennel makes a magnificent tea, a lovely licorice flavored tea. Um, what I like to use it a lot is to make uh, pestos. You know, this time of year you can't really get basil, it's way too early for basil to grow here. But if you take this and combine this with some of the other plants, a little of that radish, they give a little bite to it. Um, all around California, there's hedges of rosemary. Rosemary with fennel and something a little spicy makes just a great base for a pesto. And then you can slap it on your chicken or fish. It's really good. I, I, Andy's kind of like, when he tells you all this, kind of when maybe, but he's, he's right on. It really, it's good. And this plant here is, a, is actually a native California plant, but not native here. It's native to Southern California. I believe this one is Catalina cherry. And they plant it a lot around as an ornamental, around shopping centers and things like that. And then the birds carry the cherries out. And so you can actually collect the Catalina cherry. It's kind of a weird cherry because it's very thin fleshed, but you, you know, you could make, you know, you could boil it and the flesh itself would make, a, the Indians used to eat it, but they also used to use the seed and they would grind it up like they do an acorn to make a cereal, but they have to, you gotta be a little careful because it's a little high in, like almonds, it's a little high in cyanide. But I guess they they probably mixed it with acorns and other things to flavor, to give a you know almondy flavor to their acorns because acorns are a little more bland. Mm -hmm. So they you know they kind of tailored their gruel, you know, their cereals. I also found out a lot. You know, I always imagine you know you have to leach acorns. I found out in reading some ethnography about how most Indians actually leached because they didn't have big containers. How were they going to leach this stuff? Turns out they went to the side of a waterway like this where there was sand and they actually shaped a bowl in the sand, a perfect bowl, and then they would lay the ground up um, acorn a few inches thick and then they could run water through it and it would run through into the sand and after they did it a bunch of times they would scrape off the layer off the sand wow sounds like that takes a long time look at the range of colors i mean could you get a more beautiful flower than this uh, look at the you know you just go and sometimes you find these you know they range from white to purples to pinks they were just stunning. Okay, so across the way, a lot of hemlock. Oh, here's, here's a protein for you. Our helix, our European garden snail that was brought here to be eaten. And uh, by, <laughs> by French and others, and it escaped. And uh, at my place in Aromas in the early years, something I used to go out after it rained and I used to be able to fill a bucket in 20 minutes worth of them. And then as my landscape developed more permaculture, it's become one of the rarest 
creatures. I find maybe three a year when I used to find 500 in an hour. And I used to take them down to my pond, crush them up and feed them to the fish in the pond. But look at how gorgeous this branch of this, look at, look at how well that snapped off. This is, you know, like eating broccoli. And it's so good when you get it like this as a stir fry. Um, I think I'll keep a few of these myself, actually. <laughs> Bring them home. Just, they're, they're just at the perfect stage right now with all this rain and so tender. Thank you, sir. Rabbi or it's just rabbi. <laughs> yeah, I'm the atheist rabbi for this. <laughs> Except the strange thing about this here, and I don't like to admit this, and it, is that I feel like I'm finding religion. And the reason is I've been talking to people. You know, I, I'm a member of the California Rare Fruit Growers. I've been foraging my whole life. I have never in my life seen the kind of flowering of fruit trees that's going on. And I've asked other people, like my friend Larry Rebecca, who has citrus plants outside his place, and he says they have three to four times as much flowers as he has ever seen in his 40 years of being there. And my suspicion, when I'm not thinking religious wise, like, you know, of Gaia, or, you know, I come from a line of rabbis. I'm not ready to embrace Jehovah yet, but I, uh, my theory on this, as my grandfather said in Spanish, but I'll say it in English, they give their meat to the devil and the bones to God. He's old now, and now he's getting religious. No, I, I, I think that something profound has happened. I'm originally a biologist. I graduated highest honors from the University of California in biology. And if I was going to put my science hat on, I would say what happened was around the world, we are dumping way less environmental pollutants in the world and all the plants are responding to that change and by flowering incredibly you know some people will say oh it's the rain but we're only at just about normal rainfall we've had years that had twice rainfall and i've never seen it like this before so i have plants that were dying in my yard that have suddenly put on huge new bursts of growth that i was getting ready to rip out because i thought they were dead and so, there, you know, there's this incredible redemption, rebirth going on in the natural mm -hmm. world. And in a lot of ways, I think it's kind of a, a sign that there is a hopeful future for us. And, right. and, um, and that's, I think that a big part of what foraging is about is about actually looking at things that other people don't see as up of worth and seeing what's of value there. And you know, they, they always said that the Chinese believe that every crisis is an opportunity, you know, this kind of combination. I mean, our middle class in America was, in, was born of the Great Depression, of FDR. It's so sad, unfortunately, that the Democratic Party had force-fed us something other than Bernie Sanders, who was ready to give us a rebirth. So instead, we're going to have something God knows we're going to have. <laughs> but because uh, that's what we're due for. We need to take the crisis we have. My mentor, a guy named Art Pearl, was asked when Barack Obama was elected in 2008 by kids in inner city Portland. They asked him, is Barack Obama going to be a great president? And he said he had the opportunity to be a great president because all great presidents come during times of great crisis. Unfortunately, he didn't rise to that crisis, and so he didn't make it into the pantheon of great presidents. I mean, he's not. Yeah. So this over here is Koyon, and it is native, but it's also used a lot in landscape. Is it edible? Uh, yeah, the berry of Koyon is edible, but not incredible. It is, uh, <laughs> The Indians used it. They often pounded it with meat and other things to add some starches and sugars and vitamins. But when I've eaten it before, I thought, that's not really very interesting. <laughs> not very good. But the tree, looking out, oh, we're starting to see this. Oh, by the way, this year there's also way more bumblebees than I've, ever, than I've seen in years. And that's another thing that's showing me. I, I have a honeybee hive that survived for about three years in an old abandoned hive. And this year, it's got a population that's at least three times larger than I've seen. They're really exploding. So this guy is called bull malva. 
and a little further on, we're gonna to start to see bigger and bigger ones. And actually about two weeks ago, I came and took, I took cuttings. People go, what are you taking cuttings of a weed? Edible. Yeah. I took cuttings of this weed because there's some plants up there that have leaves that are this big and they are less hairy than most now. So it's, it's very spinach-like, but they, they look magnificent for making, for making wraps where you put, you know, whatever, rice and vegetables inside. And so I told my friend Richard Smith, who's an ag advisor, and I showed him my driveway that I'd taken these cuttings. And he says, I have never seen anybody take cuttings of that <laughs> weed before. And they're all rooting. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to transplant them in my yard because I only have small ones of them. So here they are. Sometimes it has beautiful yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's related to hibiscus, so you can look at the flower, and uh, you can see how it's all kind of curled up in this little, it's related to lavatera, hibiscus, it's related to um, cotton, and to okra, hmm. and take a, grab a, one of the leaves and just chew on it. And see, here's a fairly decent, um, oh, here's a beauty. So this... I went, I came the other day, and this is a, this is a weed that they for years have tried to eradicate out here, but it actually, all of us have been eating this our whole lives. This guy right here, this is sugar beet, and we used to farm sugar beet around here, and uh, it escaped, and it, just like when you grow Swiss chard, pick a piece of that green, and tell me that isn't one of the finest greens you've ever eaten in your life. Mm -hmm. And cooked, it is so much better than Swiss chard. It's far more tender, it's sweeter, and it has a giant. And I'm going to show this. And somebody needs to take this guy home, or I'll take it back to my yard. Be careful, it's full of ladybugs. Don't take them out. Don't break it. I'm going to take it out. Hey, this is considered, considered something you eradicate, you know? It's a treasure. Unless you shovel. Rachel, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so a couple so questions. Here's, a, by the way, somebody else is pounding down on it. A beautiful scale. Poisonous plants from edible plants. Which I don't eat until I've de-slimed. So next to it over here is milk thistle. Oh, hang on one second, I think we have a question. Okay. And I'm done. Say your question again. Can you mute the background noise? Uh, sure. Um, look, how, look how rich the soil is. Okay, so the first question is, well, first there's a request for stinging nettle. If we can identify stinging nettle, that would be helpful. And second, um, is there a way to tell poisonous plants from edible plants? An annual and a perennial stinging nettle yeah, down here. Good. Gotcha. Andy, th there's questions about identifying edible plants. Is there a way other than just recognizing? You have to know. The, you have to know the. There's no rule for edible plants, and you don't want to test them because you could be testing. You could say, "Hey, that looks just like the parsley at my place." And be eating hemlock, and a little bit of hemlock can do you a lot of harm. So the trick in all of this is there's no avoiding actual knowledge, which is something that we don't do in school. They, they believe that it's, you're supposed to be problem solving or, uh, oh, I don't know, researching, but actually, but most of our ancestors through most of history actually believe knowledge was of value. And that's part of why we're in so much trouble is because we don't know history, we don't know biology, we don't know geology, we don't know much of anything. And so we are very uh, subject to being fooled by people like our, our political leaders, because we don't know enough to, as my mentor used to say, have a crap detector. He said the purpose of education is to give people a crap detector. Right. Because if you can't detect crap, you're about to be let off the cliff. Right. And that's what we've been going through, not just, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not partisan on this, although I am a Democrat, I have to say both parties have been feeding us crap
for a very long time. And you can see the reaction, and I'm very partisan. I'm a delegate for Bernie Sanders. I'll probably go to the convention if there is a convention, because I understand Bernie just withdrew from the race. But if there is still a convention, I've been told I'm probably going to be one of his delegates at the convention, because we have to make a decision what comes on first. But because we're such bad crap detectors, we didn't end up choosing the last best hope for humanity, which is Bernie Sanders. Because unlike all the others, he understands that in a crisis like this, we have to seize and solve all our problems. So, so back, that, enough of that political commercial. And then to answer the other question, we are going to get to nettle soon. Yes. Look at the soil. Okay. Yeah, the soil is spectacular. And that's because you've got so much really, really rich or you know, plants growing all the time. And then they decay here, you know, cycle after cycle after cycle. They're growing, they're decaying, and they're making some of the most beautiful soil that you'll ever see anywhere. Much better than any of the farmlands around here. You could grow anything along this wetlands. And speaking of anything, this is a European plant called milk thistle which is a close relative of artichoke. That's one of its, and it tastes like artichoke. If you were to cut, it's, it's painful. You wouldn't eat it raw at this stage, but you could take one of these guys. Yes, <laughs> you could take one of these, bring it home, chop it up, you know, with a pair of gloves on, boil it and make a similar blended soup and it would taste like artichoke. It was, it's delicious. He made it for me, but he made like five gallons. Of yeah. He knows how to do it. Yeah, but, but further, Milk thistle turns out to contain a chemical called silmarin. And silmarin, the seeds in particular, you, you can buy milk thistle extract seeds, is used to treat liver ailments. It protects the health of your liver. And in its most um, famous application, um, it's been used to protect people from poisoning against the death cap, Amanita phylloides. There's a doctor in Santa Cruz who uses an extract from the seed when usually an immigrant who doesn't know our mushrooms comes and eats one of our most common mushrooms in the oak woodland, Amanita phylloides, the death cap, usually because it looks like a mushroom back home that they ate. And in the old days, almost everybody died because it blocks the transcription of messenger RNA and it makes it so you can't make new proteins. That's crazy. And so the first thing that fails is the organs that have high turnover like your liver. But they now, this doctor does an extract of it and injects it and is able to protect people's livers. And most of them survive without a liver transplant. Wow. But people have used this. My mom had hepatitis and I got her to start taking um, milk thistle um, extract pills and has put her, uh, her liver ailments completely in check. She got hepatitis from her years living in Africa. She lived there for 35 years. But I... I think it's an absolutely delicious vegetable, you know, and all, it's not a big deal. As, as, soon as, as soon as you boil it, those thorns don't mean anything. And so you have it, I'm sure, on your phone. We do. Yeah, we do. Look again at the stand of the radish turlock. And he told me you couldn't see them anywhere. And meanwhile, all these people who are hungry are being told that they shouldn't walk this way. But I can tell you one thing, if these people, if this were Palo Alto, or this were the Monterey Peninsula, if these people were not Latino, there's no way in the world they would get away with telling these people they couldn't walk here. Because it's not a big enough crowd to worry about. It's one thing if people were coming here and there was a big crowd built up, and look at the size of it. There's no issue here. It's because these people are powerless. And because the elected officials here really don't give a damn what's good for people. Because what's good for people right now is to get out, be in nature, feel hopeful, not not feel despair. Look at look at how look at how lush I have never seen radish leaves like this in my entire life. Small them, right, Annie? Yes, but yes, but no, but look at the oh, look at the size of these leaves. I mean, you could get, make a most magnificent stir fry. Look at these broccolettes forming over here. I mean, tell me you couldn't just make, you could, you could, you could have a whole workshop where you've worked up 25, 30 recipes just off this. 
That's the Malva again. The full Malva. Yeah. Yeah. Some more beautiful, yeah, you get better a, stuff because the spring looks like the leaves are really big and nice. Yeah. Where you can really see like you want to eat them. Those are kind of like. I'm not a great gardener, but the birds are just the birds. The birds are enjoying the spring. The birds. The bird. Spring has sprung. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll give you a Brooklyn. I my, my family comes from the old country, from Brooklyn. My parents both uh, were born in Brooklyn, children of immigrants. They both went to Brooklyn College. That back in the days when college was free tuition. They I went to Brooklyn College. Yes, exactly. It was not free. <laughs> but it used to be. It used to be free, and they could never have gone if it wasn't. And that's what Bernie was trying to bring back. But here's a Brooklyn poem for you about burdens. Spring has sprung. The grass has riz. I wonder where the voidies is. The void is on the wing. My void. How absurd. I thought the wing was on the void. <laughs> okay, so out there, what do we got? Cormorants, seagulls, ducks. This has the potential because it's almost all non-native. There are a few native species. You have Sacramento blackfish, which is an incredible species. It's one of the few large filter feeding fish, and it's native to these backwater areas, and it filters out down to little blue-green bacteria. It cleans the water. Yeah, so aquaculturists use it. They get up to be about this big, and in the gold rush, when we had a lot of Chinese doing a lot of work on building railroads and all that, the Chinese treasured it because they could keep it in a trough. They survived in really low oxygen conditions and they treasured live fish, you know, because they knew they were fresh and you want them live. So they used to have troughs of these Sacramento blackfish and they're in here. But the, but the major fish that are out here are non-natives. Non there are carp, probably upwards of 20 pounds in large numbers. There are brown bullhead. There are bass, there are, you know, black bass, which are native, all these are native elsewhere. The carp are native to Europe, the, black, the bass, the bluegills, the green sunfish, the crappie, and the brown bullhead are all native to other parts of North America on the other side of the Rockies. They've all been introduced out here, but they're in huge numbers out here. And especially the carp, we could have a carp derby out here. You know, with people going out with, with guides, young people, you know, sh showing people that, and you know, have contests for the biggest carp. And if they are clean, which is what, if the state gave a damn about the people around here, because in, in about one hour, I've asked all these elected officials for years, why don't you order the toxicology lab, the Department of Fish and Game, to capture one, take them about an hour, or in a net, they take them a few minutes and bring it to the toxicology lab and find out so that these people don't get sick on it. And if they are good, and since we have basically an eradication program, they could go out, collect these, because smoked carp is one of the world's most delicious things. They have enough oil in them and enough texture to make, uh, okay, and okay, let's get back. Here's some more of that sugar beet. You begin to recognize it because it looks like Swiss chard. And you see the stems, but this is so much better than Swiss like, chard. You know how thick Swiss chard is and kind of rough? Look at how tender and beautiful these are. you see this grows like year round here, Andy? Swiss it does, chard. but this time of year it's at its best. But all you need to do is to dig this thing up because the root is a perennial. You take this and you put this in your garden, you're going to have vegetables for the next 20 years. Amazing. <laughs> and it is so good. Rachel, we have one more question. Um, people are wondering if there's a book that he can recommend for beginners. Yeah. Amy, do you have a book you'd recommend for beginners? I do. Um, Mike, what have you those two books? Oh, okay. oh, they're in your backpack? Yes, I got them. Okay, I started when I was in junior high school. I went foraging in our school library. And I happened to forage two books that I didn't return. <laughs> From I the saw, wild. Yes. Because um, nobody else in my library had ever taken them out as far as. Like neutral Omaha. And so. Marlon Perkins. And so, these two books by 
Saint Ewell, Ewell Gibbons. I grew up worshiping this man. Um, one, my friend Todd Newberry, who's a professor at UCSC, he's still retired, said a lot of people make fun of Ewell Gibbons. They used to joke about him. He said he was probably one of the greatest naturalists this country ever created. And his classic book is called Stalking the Wild Asparagus. And I, I couldn't find it. My son's moved my books and I was looking for it. <laughs> this, is, this was his second book. And I think it is incredible. It's called Stalking the Blue-Eyed Scallop. And it's all about gathering things in, in, along the ocean. Because during the, he grew up um, eating and his family, they were poor, eating all sorts of things that they gathered. I think it was Appalachia. But when the Great Depression came, so we're now in a similar place, our depression that we're having right now, he took off as a young man, riding the rails, and building on his knowledge of what he could eat. And then he hooked up with a family that was of Okies that were moving up and down the coast here and learned to forage the ocean because he wasn't from the ocean. And he learned to get scallops and mussels and other things. And eventually he wrote, oh, stalking the blue-eyed scallop, stalking the wild asparagus, stalking the healthful, healthful herbs. There's a book he has called Stalking the Good Life. The Beachcombers Journal, he's got another one from Hawaii, about Hawaii. They are still in print, you know, I think these were written in like 1960, and you can still buy them. They're still incredibly what popular. The, Stalk, the, the first one for plants is called Stalking the Wild Asparagus, even though it's a, 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 a escapee. And all of them I recommend is the best. Not only is it full of great knowledge, but he's also incredibly entertaining to read, and his recipes always work. Nice. Awesome. Very good. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. We have another request for nettles. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I haven't found him yet. I've been on a movie. If you're going to be political at sizing all day long, we're going to be amazing. We can walk and talk. Everything <laughs> is political. There's not a thing in this world, and those people who like to pretend that there are things that are not political are deluding themselves. Just like when I pointed out the fact that these people hey, can't, professor, we're the good you know, the people can't come out to walk here, that's political. It has to do with it. It has to do with it. I'll be out here with a sign tomorrow. Or or keep some park jail open. I'll go to jail. People should all demand. We should have everybody show up tomorrow and go for a walk here. And tell the tell the authorities that they have no justification yeah, for shutting the mob, flash mob, right? During yes. The, yeah, as long as they stay ten feet apart, we're gonna get a little closer, stay a little further. <laughs> but it is an outrageously ridiculous idea that this could look at the crowds. Can you see the crowds out here? You can go you can go to the grocery store, but you can't come here. <laughs> right. Hemlock. Oh, okay. See, there's edible stuff hiding amongst Yeah, underneath it. And then there's more of that acacia melanoxylon. Okay, there we go. You're starting to see this, this uh, bull mouth, and you're starting to get them up to the wrap size. But I've seen them even bigger than that. We'll get them even bigger. Oh, by the way, that red stuff, a lot of people think, what the heck is that red stuff? In the water there. That is called mosquito fern. And ah. they actually believe that that is what they may grow on space stations to feed people. Because huh. mosquito fern is actually a symbiotic relationship of an aquatic fern and a nitrogen fixing blue green algae. And, the, and they are able to produce, they're very high in protein. That's their red stuff floating on the surface it's, it's kind of lacy when you look at it up front up close and sometimes the whole slough is covered with it and they could probably um there was a website about mosquito fern where the guy was actually gathering it and drying it and powdering it and using it to make baked goods and things that were high protein no and i don't know which one that one is watergrass like tends to be more Running water. Run, more running water, but what you have along the edge here is cattails. And the first time I ever heard about cattails as edible was in Yule Gibbon's book. When he, the chapter in cattails is called Cattail Supermarket of the Swamp. 
because the Indians and actually all around the world, people depended on cattails. The roots are full of starch. You can make a flour out of it. The uh, young stems, when they first come up, they used to, in Europe, they used to call it Cossack asparagus. It's a delicious vegetable when you just pull the early on. And then later on, when it starts to form the cattail thing, you can pull it off and cook it like a corn on the cob. And then finally, when it goes to full flour, they collect the pollen. You can use the pollen to make a protein-rich flour and pancakes. And a lot of native peoples around the world use it for ceremonies to mark babies and things. Yeah. Which ones are the cattails? These guys, right over the green shoot. shoot. And all in front of it, this is the Him Himalayan blackberry that everybody says is such a terrible thing. And by the way, um, a pitch for elderberry right now. If you are not taking elderberry right now in this crisis, you had better be. Um, elderberry uh, has a chemical called anthocyanins, and the research shows, particularly out of Israel, but we've known this for centuries, that anthocyanins, or the elderberry in particular, um, essentially inhibits the growth of viruses. And the mechanism is that viruses need to attach to cells in order to inject their genetic material to reproduce. And then they, they go in, they inject their chromosome. The chromosomes allow for many, many copies. The cell explodes, usually in synchrony with other cells. That's what they mean by going viral. Now thousands of these viruses are moving on to attack other cells. And what elderberry does, elderberry stops or inhibits the ability of viruses to attach to cells so they can't reproduce. And so I've been taking elderberry constantly through this. There's some debate about whether I have or have not been infected, but I am, you know, throughout the whole process, I've been walking eight miles a day. So I've had a few symptoms <laughs> on occasion. Um, so I don't know. Of course, nobody knows what they have because nobody can get tested. Right. Because we have a completely dysfunctional healthcare system in the United States because of years of believing that healthcare system should be controlled by the private sector and by investors instead of by any kind of public effort to meet public needs. That's why in other countries, people have been tested. And that's why so few people got sick in a place like Cuba that they were able to send their doctors to Italy to help them with the crisis because they actually have a healthcare system as do most countries in the world. And of course, we were told that the one pres presidential candidate who wanted to give us a health care system was some kind of unrealistic utopian. <laughs> we're going to find some nettles soon. Lots of hemlock. There's going to be nettles coming. Let's see. Where are our nettles? I've seen them down here. There's a really big uh, bull mallow up ahead. Here's some more of the sugar beet. Going yep. to seed. Okay. <laughs> What's dangerous about the uh, hemlock is the stems are long and dry, and you like to make like a flute out of them and break them and blow them. Mm -hmm. You don't want to touch them to your lips. Kids will do that. I to do it with my grandkids, and then until I learned better. Watch that. Hello there, folks. Oh, there's some up here we can get closer. Yeah, look I see them where the whole thing is just flowered all the way to the top of the street. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I can make wine in the water and urine. <laughs> Don't tell, them, don't tell them my camera about the red mushrooms with the white dots. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to make all the noise of a mud hand. We're hoping we get a little more rain because it might pop out. My, where is our. I know this thing is out of here. There was some right off the side. Uh, uh, I see the first there. of it. There's some stinging nettle. Oh. 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 Where did you get Andy? I'm stuck. 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 i Andy just got wrapped in a vine falling down the hill, but he's going to be okay. Just give us a minute. <laughs> okay, Andy, how you doing? Nothing yet. Left foot. Right here. Left foot. Okay. Left foot. Oh, this left foot over here. The other left foot. Okay. Oh, yeah, you got this. Hey, Andy, you didn't do the fob wire last week, huh? Oh, oh, uh, wait a second. Is he okay? No. I'm good. Okay. Ooh, right into the let thorn. Him have, let him have his give himself up because he's young. Ooh. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> what would you do? Want there, Andy? Let me yeah, go get it. Let the sixty-eight-year-old guy go get it. It's his left leg going. Okay, I'm good. Soon to be the great grandfather of twelve. Okay, here we go. Here's our stinging nettle that they've been asking about. <laughs> that was blackberry to come. Yeah, yeah, look at that. It was very. That was what was wrapped it's around my. Yeah, it's going to sting you pretty oh, good. This is the non-native? They're both non-native. Non okay. okay. So this is the perennial stinging nettle, one of the world's most nutritious vegetables. It tends to only grow at places with incredibly fertile soil and wet areas. You usually cut off the top. You don't want to grab it because it's sting. Out here. Or yeah, here. Well, yeah, it's sting is about as bad as a bee sting. And it's, it's got, like it right but now. people who have got uh, arthritis and things, treat themselves with it because some of the chemicals in it actually are anti-inflammatory right but it is uh incredible nutrition in flavor uh, in recent uh weeks i made a hummus where i you know 80 percent of it was uh garbanzos and then i steamed and blended this nice. to make a green hummus that was really really good and probably way more protein rich than the plain hummus it makes a magnificent soup for a typical blended soup. It also can just be used like a spinach as a green. You just chop it up and stir fry it nice. or uh, any other or, or, or steam it. Um, this is the annual? This is the perennial. Oh, that's And gnarly. actually for a person who wants to grow this, and I did this just recently, it has underground stems or stolons, kind of like a mint. It's a relative of mint. And you can just dig those up, and in a moist place on your property, you can establish a bed. Go ahead, dig it up. Let me see. I don't believe you. <laughs> Professor, rabbi, whatever. Sure, is this going to get me? Yeah, a little bit. That's all right. I have a little bit of arthritis. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here it comes. No. Okay. There's a little piece of it. It's going off this direction. Ouch. Yeah. Black, right? this way so both those will work these pieces will grow i don't need the stem you don't need the stem no it will grow from a chunk oh, of that man. it's this stuff used to be deadly as a kid because you'd be walking in the creek to go fishing and it ruined your day because it hits you and you look like you had you chicken can see the new, you can see the new sprout right there and it's pokey all the way down it'll get you right down to the end but these pieces if you just took this and shove this in the ground and it will uh, grow we have a moist place if you've got good fertile soil. Perfect if you have people coming in your yard getting your land. And a lot of people have been talking <laughs> to folks who are trying to establish it at their yards right now because they, and uh, during uh, war periods in Europe, when agriculture was disrupted, knowledgeable people would go out to the wetlands and collect, especially in Russia when the Germans were attacking Russia, the people knew how to 
You have to take this stuff and you also can feed it to their animals. Once you dry it, there's no sting. They could feed it to chickens. They could feed it to cows. They could put aside a whole bunch of it so nobody starved during the winter. So, and it's considered not just protein rich, but some of the most rich in vitamins and minerals of any plant on earth. And that's part of why it has these stings because every animal around would want to eat this. But we have ways to deal with this. As soon as, don't eat this. Yeah. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as you cook well, that. You smell it too, it smells yeah. bad. Yeah, as soon as you cook it, the sting is gone. Right. And as soon as you dry it, this thing is gone. It makes a wonderful tea. Is that one your wood rats? Uh, yes. Probably a wood he rat. He wants yeah. to eat a wood rat. In the worst <laughs> yes. and he never killed anything. So like, this is our native. This, this is a nest of our native See, this rat. This is the stuff I was telling you. Oops, the grandkids like to do that. Thing. Yeah, but that's, that's right. That's that's you don't want them to do it. So that's a wood rat nest over there, probably. Uh, not necessarily. It's hard to say. I think it is. Because you got a stump there. It looks like the collections I've seen for wood rats, and, and maybe another one over in that direction. It's hard to say. Sometimes you can tell for sure because there's so much collections of twigs. We have a lot of them on my property. And my understanding is the way the Native Americans, the young people used to hunt the wood rats, and they would come and they would light the nest on fire. And then when the rat came running out, they'd you know, spear them and then have a rat on a stick, <laughs> which I, and I envy them. <laughs> Fennel, we found some back before. I get a little torn when I fell down. Oh, not yeah. too bad. Okay. Oh, Could have been worse. All right, I'm going to head back and up. I didn't actually tear my leg out. That's a good thing. <laughs> my expensive $13 pants from Costco, the best pair of pants I ever bought in my life, <laughs> because they are super flexy. Oh, 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 you did cut yourself. Oh, get some of that stuff and spray on there. Your, your antiviral stuff. Aha, uh -huh. my own. Let me get it for you. My own hand, handmade. I always wanted to play doctor. With so this is seventy-one percent ethanol, um, hand sanitizer it's, it's, uh, that we made ourselves, um, where we essentially made moonshine, because moonshine is not a, you can't buy it legally in the state. So we made it, and this is good enough for a. Uh, what are we heading for next, Professor? We'll see. Okay. Right around the corner. The tape's almost run out. <laughs> Lots of hemlock. So imagine this wetlands. I frankly think this is the future of Watsonville's economy. As you have launching docks here like in Costa Rica where ecotourism is the center. You have trained biologists, ecotourists, graduates from the schools. They take folks out on birding tours. They capture the fish. They come back and serve a wonderful meal of smoked carp. And I, you know, and by the way, the, uh, the eggs of carp, what's the name of the, uh, it's a Greek, I just can't, I can't remember the name of it. It's a, they use the roe mixed with uh, bread and I think uh, like uh, sour cream or something. It'll come to me, but it's a traditional dip that they use. And these guys, probably a big one, has like five or six pounds of that row. It's like caviar. Yeah. So, sir, is this tidal and this, it looks like the tide's coming in? It is not. It's actually, at this point, landlocked. It, there's a flood gate, a tide gate down by Pajaro Dunes that stops the salt water for a year or two more. With the rising oceans, this is going to become an intertidal estuary the same way Elkhorn Slough is. Right. Because we're not going to be able to keep back the oceans much longer. Of course, this year, we actually have less greenhouse gases than any year in, in the last 40. Right. Because of the slowdown, and that's part of the reason why everything in the world looks so good. Right. Is because we have been thwarted. Right. Okay, there's a neat plant. Oh, wait. Four hound. Oh, all right. Yeah. So this is a non-native again from Europe. Uh, some people remember four hound uh, candy. They used to candy the stems of it with a load of sugar. There it, it is. is. You can eat it, but watch out for the hemlock. It's also very. It's very bitter, but it's very medicinal. And so uh, 
what people sometimes do is they'll mix it with things like fennel, you know, like 10 parts fennel to one part whorehound. But it's not like. But you can see that it's a member of the mint group because you can see that the stems are square. Look at the cross section yeah. of the stem. That's how you know the members of the mint group. That includes things like uh, rosemary, mint, um, basil. <laughs> they all have square stems. I know, it doesn't taste good, but... No, but imagine <laughs> if they put imagine a ton of... Imagine it mixed about 10 oh, to see. 1 with fennel. Right. So just yeah, a no. tiny bit to make fennel give another dimension. Because, you know, we all like coffee, which is bitter. That's you true. You just have to bring it down to a... So is that a giant ladybug? I can't really see with my eyes, but it looks like one right there. Or is that a bee? I can't see. I think it's a piece of... I think it's uh, something that fell off of right. the of the acacia melon. Yeah, it's so junk. Sorry, thanks. So, Andy, we're at, at about an hour. You want to pick um, some more favorites? I'm looking to see if I can find some more favorites. Uh, kind of, we might want to go back the other direction. I'm, I'm feeling like our selection is getting thinner. There is the blackberry, which is my absolute, the best fruit in, uh, in this region. This is the... Um, the highly unliked Himalayan blackberry that is considered a pernicious weed everywhere and just try to attack you. And all of wildlife loves it. All these birds work on it and feed on it. Um, the uh, flowers attract incredible numbers of pollinators. They build the soil underneath tremendously. And, you know, in terms of, uh, organic matter in the soil. So anywhere where you cleared a little piece of it and planted, it would have very rich soil. And the berries, as I was starting to say about um, elderberry, with the, uh, um, got a, I'm a little shaken up here for my fall. The, um, God, what, what are the, what are the um, pigments in uh, anthocyanins? So when they talk about elderberry helping you to fight viruses, they say it's the anthocyanins in it. Blackberry has, if anything, more anthocyanins than elderberry. And uh, the only, and there also is a long tradition of using blackberry syrups for medicinal purposes in Europe as well. So I've actually been drinking a combination. My, my freezer had to be defrosted in this emergency. I had to store stuff. And I had all these packages of organic blueberries, gathered blackberries, uh, organic strawberries, and elderberries that I had collected. And I, then, I collected them all. <laughs> I soaked them in vodka, and I made this wonderful mixed berry liqueur. But I've been using it lately mixed with water, about 10 parts water to one part liqueur. And the last day, I've been sipping it nonstop. Because the, <laughs> yes, because the instructions that they give you for elderberry are wrong, I think. If you think about how a virus reproduces, they have these periodic outbreaks where they're all reproducing, they're breaking cells. And if you really want to inhibit that, you have to have the anthocyanins in your system when they're having their outbreak, right. not in between. And so to take it three times a day when you don't know when your outbreak is, is like firing into the wetlands three times and expecting to kill a duck. Right. You know, and so it occurred to me because I kind of have this lingering viral uh, cold sore in the back of my throat and a, uh, a little bit soreness. Oh, this is the beauty. This is what I mean about this guy being a beautiful thing for rats. Imagine that. With uh, around, you teach you know, wrapped with like say, if you're a, a meat eater with some shrimp or chicken with rice, if you're a vegetable eater, say some tofu and mushrooms inside that as a beautiful wrap and it holds together. People make uh, the uh, what do they call them the uh, grape leaf uh, with the uh, rice, they, they've used malva leaves for that too. Nice. So that's a, that's a, that's the plant that I took home big cuttings of, and I'm now rooting because I want to have a stand like that somewhere on my property, right. so I can have all the malva I would ever want. So there, those were a couple favorites. Nice. Um, now, and I recommend um, both with elderberries. I wrote up a, 
a proposal called the California Elderberry Project. I don't know if I sent it to you guys or not. I've been talking to legislators because you cannot buy elderberry products right it's now. Hard. Yeah. At any store online, you have to search like hell. Yeah. It's hard to get. And that's happening all around the world where people are seizing on. California has elderberry everywhere. Uh -huh. It is along all wetland areas, along especially you know this area has been cut down too often. But uh, the elderberry, which is in every probably in every state of the United States, is particularly easy to find in California because we have limited wet areas. So all you have to do is walk down a stream drainage or along highways where there's runoff. And you find elderberries, and they produce pounds and pounds of elderberry. And the only thing you have to think about with elderberry is that the stems are somewhat toxic. So, so what people do is they'll use like an afro comb, and they'll comb out the berries, leaving the stem behind. Or another technique is to take a whole bunch of them and put them in a the freezer, intact, and then take them and put them on an inclined plane, you know, like a cutting board with a towel and break it up and the stems get stuck and the little frozen little balls roll right. down. Yeah. And nice. you can make loads of elderberry syrup. There's a lot of stuff on the internet about making it because I think, and this is my prediction, being that we are have no real intelligent response to this virus, I expect next winter is gonna be worse than this winter. Interesting. And we're going to need, and I am absolutely convinced that the elderberry has a great deal of effect on uh, on the spread on the curtailing people's infections, keeping them in check, making the symptoms much less, making it shorter, you know, and 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 keeping you feeling decent. Yeah. And maybe the blackberry, we have to test it to see if it's as good because it has lots of anthocyanins. Maybe both of them need to be gathered. But what I suggest this summer is that we put public resources behind gathering huge amounts. We've got loads of wineries that can crush the stuff. It's easy to process it and, and bottle it. And so instead of people scrambling and frantic to get their elderberry, we should have loads of it. It would be a good use of taxpayer money. And the other thing about elderberry is it's one of the world's easiest plants to propagate. You take a cutting, you know, branch of it with a few nodes, three or four nodes, and you shove it into moist ground, and it is already flowering within a year. Nice. And, and so I've, I'm already propagating in my driveway several hundred of them, and I've wow. also been going up and down the, the easements, the wet areas around, and sticking them in the ground. Nice. Once you get them started, can you yank them out and put them somewhere else? Yes, you could. You could start a whole bunch in a wet area where you don't want to have to water, and then come back and dig them up, and then move them, nice. spread them out. Yeah. So we could be creating elderberry areas all over because we don't know if this is going to be a one-year, a two-year, a three-year pandemic. The Spanish flu was worse the second year than the first year. Much worse. They thought everything was over when the weather got nice and all these people, young people, started doing what young people do. And this, the beauty, and a lot of people don't understand why in some ways we're blessed by this disaster, and that sounds kind of weird. This is, this is one of the most benign plagues that humanity has ever faced. The Spanish flu killed young people almost exclusively. Right. The reaction to the flu, the people's immune response is what killed them. And so those young people, people like me, 62 years old, looked at their young at their 20 year olds dying around them and it destroyed hope, right? Whereas all, this plague, and I, I have an 85 year old mother, and we're doing our best to make sure that she doesn't get exposed to anybody, but this plague is more attacking folks who are already vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's not wiping out the young generation. And that gives us the ability to, if we actually spend our resources well, to, to do our develop our tests, to develop our and you know our vaccines, and to diminish this mess. But unfortunately, places like us, we're going to have to depend on countries that are functional. I'm sure the Chinese 
are going to develop the test way before we are. They're probably going to develop the vaccine before we are. Maybe our labs can do the vaccine. But, you know, everybody's working on that. Yeah. But so that elderberry, um, I believe that not only should we be collecting them, but we should be launching public efforts to plant it all over. Because not only is it native, not only is it good for us, it's one of the best plants for, na for wildlife. Loads of birds eat it. Butterflies feed on the uh, blossoms. It's beautiful. They, Native Americans used it for their clappers. That's right. The natives made <laughs> clapper <laughs> sticks out of it because they considered it sacred. Oh, is that some milk thistle over there? Uh, <laughs> yes, right there. Yeah. Beautiful milk thistle right there. Nice stand that you could make yourself a gorgeous soup out of. Yeah. Yeah, and, and look at us! Look at how spectacular and beautiful that. They only is. last like this a while. Then so in, in the summertime, when they get this beautiful purpley blossom, and then they go to seed, my wife Mary and I walk the road and we stop and we collect some of the seeds, kind of tentatively, you know, because they're prickly, and we eat them as we walk on our hikes because we know we're doing our livers some good. Uh, professor, what do they taste like? Uh, sl very slightly bitter and kind of nutty. Pretty nice. So I'll eat maybe I'll eat maybe thirty <laughs> or so seeds on a walk. So Andy, a request to talk about uh, how to find the trailhead here. Okay, the it's right by Gold's Gym, In and and right by the bridge, the main bridge that crosses the slough. But we understand that they're trying to tell people it's starting tomorrow. People can't walk here. For three I, weeks, right? No, three, I three months. Three, it's I, like three months. I, but. At risk of being arrested, I recommend that people come out, maybe each of them with a nice seven foot long stick, <laughs> and they and they do a march out here. Seven foot long, carrying a hand sanitizer with them, maybe even wearing a mask, and saying, of course, we can walk this area safer. It's a lot safer than going to the post office. Right. It's a lot safer than going to the grocery store. It's just because poor people find their recreation here, and therefore it's the thing that you take away from people. Because right. if you can't take something from poor people during a disaster, what good is your disaster? <laughs> right. That guy was heartbroken, dude. That yeah, was, he I was. He sold to come out here. You know, he's trapped in his apartment or wherever he lives. So, for you public officials who made that stupid decision, um, please come and arrest me because I have to I have to tell you that your decision is stupid you should think about looking at what's actually going on out here and whether it actually makes sense to tell people instead of just putting up a sign or even having one of your public officials at the trailhead to remind people keep your distance maybe wear your mask you know but enjoy your walk yeah. And that said with love from the bottom of Andy's heart. <laughs> yes, and I and I and I I have a tremendous empathy for those public officials trying to keep people safe. But sometimes they make some decisions without full fully thinking it out. Because somebody told them, oh, a lot of people are walking along the wetlands. And there, so their response is, oh my God, we can't have a lot of people. Well, how many people have we passed since we've been out here? Maybe like five. Five <laughs> yeah. in an hour and a half? That's not a lot of people. Yeah. I passed a hill of a lot more in Costco. Right. The other day. <laughs> so are we, uh, does anybody have any more questions? Yeah, any more questions or any closing thoughts from you, Andy? Well, I like to say that foraging builds your cognitive strength. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing when you're foraging is the two key parts of what cognition is about. Cognition is based on two skills, integration and differentiation. Finding how things connect and how they're the same and how are they different so that everything is not a blur. Because cognition is about seeing patterns in the world. And so the, the, the peoples of the world that foraged we're actually more intelligent than modern humanity. Our ancestors were far more intelligent and our brain is actually uniquely designed to keep track of patterns in nature, to know when the animals are moving through a certain area, to know at what stage a plant is usable, whether it's edible or for tools or whatever else. Yeah. That is what made us as a species and so to bring people out again foraging 
brings them back in touch with their humanity. And that's my closing remarks. Nice. I would say that two or three times through looking at these, you catch on really quick what's edible and what's not. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think I've heard frequently that the best wisdom is to pick one or two plants and get really good at those. Yeah. And then slowly, as you gain confidence, pick other plants. Well, right? I would frankly be happy. You know, I thought about this given these times. I would be happy to lead groups and show them because here it's easy. That Rachel, we have one more question. Um, someone's asking, when is the best time to pick or harvest elderberry? I'll periodically send people out of here to eradicate them. Mm -hmm. So why can't people just eradicate some for their dinner, you know? Take some home. Exactly. Yeah. And even like up there, there's a beauty. You know, find and see that beautiful yellow dandelion-like flower? Yeah. Right here. This is called sound thistle. It's genus is Sonchus, N-O-N-C-H-U-S. And sound thistle is related to lettuce. And they, when they're young, the leaves make a wonderful le lettuce-like. Well, they make a wonderful cook. They make a wonderful cook. So this is something else. This is the bristly oh, ox tongue. Okay. And this is the sand thistle. And you see the big one back yeah, there? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. You know, it's got, and it's leaves that look a little bit like the radish, but it's actually related to dandelions yeah, and it's lettuce. Kind of it's a composite. Gotcha. And it is, you probably have it on your farm. Uh -huh. And it is a very nice vegetable. And when you, especially before it starts going to the fly, you can actually eat the buds and everything. It's just a... I encourage in my yard, I let it go to seed because I enjoy gathering it. A lot of these plants, when they volunteer in my garden, rather than weeding them out, I only weed them to eat them. Yeah, right. When I said I elderberry, yeah. when is the best time? Uh, it depends on how far inland you are because the ones inland where it's warmer ripen earlier and you work your way toward the coast, ripening later and later. But uh, midsummer, and places like along the Pajaro River, there are loads of elderberry along the San Lorenzo, the San Benito, um, all around El Corn Slough. Let them know that you just want the berry, not the stem. Yeah, as I pointed out, the stem, you have to be careful. People have gotten sick by taking the whole cluster and eating all of it. The little green stems contain a toxin that, not, not, terrible but it's not good for you right so uh people who harvest a lot you can find videos of people using afro afro combs you know natural hip combs and combing out the berries yeah or as i said before using this technique where you freeze the whole thing you put it on a board with a towel over it like a flush towel you crush it up and the little frozen berries roll down to the bottom leaving the stems behind cool well, thank you, Professor. Yeah, hey, thank so you both for open. coming with yeah. us on this. You did great. Nice. I, like, I like to see you keep things moving along here. <laughs> you did great, <laughs> yep. <laughs> keep us walking. I'll be with them the rest of the week. So let's, <laughs> let's head back. All right. I think that's about it for us, Jess, if you want to take it back. Sure. Thank you all so much. So grateful. Um, that was amazing. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everybody. Does anyone else have any other questions? That was amazing. Thank okay. you. I'm so glad. I hope you all learned something. Um, thank you again for joining us. And if you do have any other questions, feel free to shoot us an email at info at terracultura.org. We can pass it along to Andy um, and make sure you get any follow-up questions answered. Um, I guess have a wonderful day and stay well. Thank you again.